Welcome to or welcome back to Wrong Sports, and I hope you have enjoyed this upset series so far. I kicked it off with my top 10 most important ties in college football history. Then I had my upsets lists, and you can check them all out in the playlist to the side or above. But for my next list, this will be my final list. I will be getting into a whole new series coming up in October. But this final list will be all about busted teams. If you don't know what that means, or maybe you don't understand what I mean by that, this is a list of teams that were thought to have great seasons, but then completely had terrible seasons, maybe either losing seasons or maybe they lost a few games that just completely ruined something. And I'll get into that as we go along. And this will be a ranked list as well. It will be from the year 2000 or before. And the reason for that is because I do have a college football team on this list from the year 2000. But before I get to the start of this list, make sure you subscribe to the channel, please, below. Also, ring the bell so you can get updates on brand new videos and of course like this video and share this video with other college football fans also share the channel with other college football fans as well also make sure you check out my patreon you can help out the channel there you can also check out my podcast i have exclusive podcasts there and you can also check out my social media in the description below but to start out this list, I actually have a three-way tie for number 10. I, I couldn't think of who I didn't want on this list, but it's going to be a three-way tie between the 1982 Nebraska team, the 1989 Florida State team, and the 1956 Notre Dame team. Now, the reason why I have 1982 Nebraska was because they went 12-1. and This offense was amazing. They were scoring over 40 points a game. But they lost one game, and that was their third game of the season to Penn State, who would end up using that one big win to propel them to the national championship game, where they also had a loss, but because they beat this amazing Nebraska team, they managed to jump over Nebraska and get into the national championship game. Of course, Nebraska would also have another busted season next year in 1983, but uh, they ended up getting a lot further than this season, so that's why uh, I wanted to make sure to mention them in this list at number 10. Also tied at number 10 is 1989 Florida State. They would start their season by losing to Clemson and then Southern Miss led by Brett Favre. And that would put them in the trench that they couldn't get out of. Even with a 10 game winning streak to finish this season, they actually beat Miami too. Miami were actually named the national champions this season. So they could have been the national champions if they wouldn't have lost uh, that terrible game to Clemson or if they wouldn't have lost to Southern Miss. If Even if they would have lost one of those games, I'm pretty sure this is 1989 Florida State team would have been the national champion. And finally, the third team that is tied for number 10 on this list is the 1956 Notre Dame team. I wanted to mention them on this list because they had the Heisman winner, Paul Horning, but really other than him, didn't have another offensive tool. He would rush and pass for more than half of the team's totals. Plus the defense did absolutely no favors for the terrible offense that Notre Dame had, as the defense was even worse, as they gave up 28 points per game, making it one of the worst Notre Dame defenses ever. Now a lot of Notre Dame fans and a lot of college football fans will say that this team was bad due to having so many underclassmen and rarely any seniors, but they still had the Heisman winners, so you would think they could go at least 500 with this team. Uh, instead, they had their worst season ever. They would bounce back next year with a huge upset over the previous undefeated Oklahoma, and they also had a winning record, so it was just really odd that this 1956 Notre Dame team would have such a bad year. But now we will have solo teams that will share each ranking on the list. At number 9, it's 1985, the Auburn Tigers. They are on this list because this team had Bo Jackson in his senior season, and they didn't even win double-digit games. This is also the season two where Bo Jackson would win the Heisman. He ran for over 1,700 yards. So just me saying that, you would think that this team would avoid the list, but they don't because they started the season ranked number two. And after having two dominating wins where Jackson averaged over 240 yards in each of those games, they would be ranked number one and they would have to travel to Tennessee to play the balls. And this game would show Auburn's only negative, their QB play. They were using three of them this season and none of them were clicking really well. Due to that and due to the fact that Tennessee held Bo Jackson
Jackson to under 100 yards and no touchdowns, Tennessee would upset Auburn 38 to 20. Yeah, that loss was pretty bad, but they still had a chance for the SEC title if they could beat the unbeaten number two Florida. The game was close and low scoring, but once again, the quarterback situation came into play and Bo Jackson couldn't win the game either for Auburn, so Florida would pull out the 14 to 10 win. This was now the second SEC loss for Auburn and it really hurts, but the third one was even worse as they ended their season in the Iron Bowl and Bo Jackson was the front runner for the Heisman going into this game and he was all but assured to win it. And and he would do everything in his power to help Auburn win this Iron Bowl too, as he would have 31 carries for 120 yards and two touchdowns. But even with that, this Iron Bowl would be crazy as there would be four lead changes in the fourth quarter and it would cap with Alabama kicking a last second field goal to beat Auburn. And that loss would send Auburn all the way to finishing sixth in the SEC. They would go to the Cotton Bowl and lose that one, ending their season eight and four but having Bo Jackson on your team and not having a competent QB really busted this team that should not have lost three times in the SEC. And we are going all the way back to 1970 for this one. Coming in at number eight, it's the 1970 UCLA football team. Tommy Protho had led UCLA to four winning seasons out of five, and this season it would start pretty good too as they would go 3-0. and But then the collapse would start in back-to-back -back weeks. First, they had a lead on number two ranked Texas all game until a Texas touchdown with 12 seconds left gave UCLA their first loss. Then the next week they would play Oregon, led by Dan Fouts, who they kept in check for the first three quarters, but then in the last quarter, Fouts would lead Oregon back, throwing three touchdowns and giving them the 41-40 win and UCLA's second loss now. Even though they had lost, they were still in the running for the Rose Bowl and had a big game for Stanford. The game was a defensive struggle though, and UCLA had a 7-6 lead late until a Stanford field goal to lose their lead again. UCLA would have one more chance and were on the 10-yard line ready to score until they fumbled and effectively ended the game. That loss pretty much ended their season as they had no way of getting to the Rose Bowl, but the real point of no return was a huge November loss to Washington where they gave up 70 points. They ended the year going 6-5, and five, including beating USC, but they got to no Rose Bowl and no secondary bowls were available for them, which made Coach Potho a little annoyed, so much annoyed that he would leave for the NFL shortly after this season. So UCLA's three close losses early in the season not only busted up their season, busted up their Rose Bowl, but also ran their coach out of town. So that is why I put them on the list at number 8. Coming in at number seven is a team that I have mentioned on a previous upsets list on my oldest upsets list. It's the 1921 Harvard football team. And I'm going all the way back for this one because Harvard was coming into this season off of two straight national title seasons. Plus, their last loss was in a shortened 1919 season. But again, I mentioned that in a previous list about how they lost to a naval team. So really, their last loss was to Yale in 1916. Harvard also won their first five games of the 1921 season, four of them by shutout, and then they beat another Southern team in Georgia. So they were really showing off how good they were, not only in the East, but also in the South. The win would also give Bob Fisher, the coach for Harvard, his 22nd win out of 24 games, and he never lost any of them either as he had two ties. But they would get their first hiccup as in game six, they tied Penn State 21 to 21. And this was the first time they gave up 21 points in five years. But even though they had a tie, the national title was still in their grasps as long as they could keep winning. But that would come to an end the next week in one of the biggest upsets, and an upset I've mentioned before, as they lost to the tiny Southern School of Centra College 6 to nothing to give them their first loss to a college team in over five years. And then Princeton would shock Harvard the next week to give Harvard back-to-back -back losses for the first time in over a decade. Those losses, and the one especially to Center College, destroyed any chance of a third straight national title for Harvard, who wouldn't come close to another national title ever again. And to round out the back half of the top 10 at number 6, it's the 1990 USC Trojans. Larry Smith was in his fourth season at USC and had Tom Marinovich back at quarterback, and they were coming off of three straight Pac-10 titles and a Rose Bowl win. But there were clear issues with Marinovich which wouldn't come to light until later. 
The collapse would start, though, as they would lose terribly to Washington in mid-September, and then the season would really be lost after a mid-October loss to Arizona, which hadn't beaten Larry Smith's USC team the previous years, and this would also end their chance at a Pac-10 title. They would also have a close loss to Notre Dame to end the regular season and would still go to a bowl game, but it was a secondary bowl game as they went to the John Hancock Bowl versus Michigan State. And they would lose to Michigan State for a third straight time, but the real story was the huge break down on the sideline that was caught on camera between coach Larry Smith and Todd Marinovich as they were both shouting at each other and it would result in Todd Marinovich going to the NFL a year early and this would also lead to a terrible 1991 season for USC and Larry Smith's eventual ousting two years later. And now I'm going to be kicking off the top five with another old team. It's from 1924, and it's the Illinois football team. This team was coming off of an undefeated 1923 season where they had one of football's first stars in Red Grange. He broke out to rush for over 700 yards and 12 touchdowns in eight games in which Illinois won all of them by pretty much more than a touchdown. Many were thinking that this team could once again go undefeated and they would also be playing Michigan this year too, which also went undefeated the previous year. Illinois would be 2-0 and when they would play Michigan at home, and in this game, Red Grange would have another start-making performance, as he started the game with a 95-yard kickoff return for a touchdown, and he would score three more touchdowns on runs of 67, 56, and 44, and he did all of this in the first 12 minutes of the game. He added a fifth touchdown to lead Illinois to a 39-14 win. After this win, Illinois and Red Grange were the talk of college football, and they would follow that up with two more wins, one of those being a shutout win over Iowa. But in their sixth game, they had to travel to Chicago to play one of the pioneers of football in Amos Alonzo Stagg and his Chicago Maroons. Stagg would make a game plan to specifically stop Grange, which kind of worked, but Illinois still would manage to score 21 points. That was the best that Chicago could do, but it would end up working for them as Chicago would also put up the most points Illinois ever gave up in 21, so they would end in a tie. This was the first non-win for Illinois since 1922, but it would also get worse, as the next week they would play Minnesota on the road. Minnesota had not won a Big Ten game that season, but found a better way to stop Grange, as they only gave up one touchdown to Illinois. Lucky for Minnesota, they were also able to do what Chicago was able to do the previous week and put up 20 points and win it. It would be the first loss for Grange while he was in college, but they rebounded nicely by winning their final game to end up 6-1-1. That record was very good, obviously, but not good enough to win the Big Ten, which was won by Chicago that year, as they had the very weird three wins, zero losses, and three ties in conference play, meaning they were the only team without a loss, thus they were the champions. Red Grange and Illinois would lose three games in 1925, but that whole season was basically speculation on where Red Grange would play after school, which might have been a distraction for him this season as well, but we'll never know, but I want to put this team on the list of biggest busted seasons because this team should have been the team that was the national champions this season if they wouldn't have lost that bad game to Minnesota or if they wouldn't have tied to Chicago either. Okay, coming in at number four is the reason why I had to make this list from 2000 or before, because it's from the year 2000. It's the 2000 Alabama Crimson Tide. And the reason why they are busted this year is because Alabama went from an SEC champion with 10 wins in 1999 to only winning three games in 2000. Yeah, I know, Alabama winning three games in a season sounds absolutely insane, and it was. But I do give Alabama some leeway. I won't put them number one on this list because they did start the season with a new running back as Sean Alexander would go to the NFL after the 1999 season to have a great career. But even without him, the team still brought back a lot of starters from that previous season and their entire coaching staff. While I'm not sure what happened, they completely fell apart this year and fell apart from the get-go as they started with an 11-point loss to UCLA, then they got shut out by Southern Miss. They would rebound after that shutout to be 3-3, three and three, but then would completely fall apart, as they would lose their last five games, and then they gave UCF their first win ever over a Power 5 school, which was huge at the time, and then they would also end their season with a dreadful 9-0 loss to Auburn. 
After that shutout loss to their rival, Alabama would fire their head coach, and this was really shocking for the team to go from 10 wins to 3 wins, because there wasn't any huge NCAA violations or injury spells, it was just a lot of bad losses all piling up at once. Coming in at number three was a team that was just starting to make a name for themselves. Coming off of a national championship season, it's the 1984 Miami Hurricanes. This was when Miami was just starting to run college football. They would have a brand new coach this season coming in as Jimmy Johnson was hired, but they would have most of their title team back, including Bertie Kosar at QB and Alonzo Highsmith at running back. They started the season in a big way as they beat preseason number one Auburn. They then rose to number one before losing to Michigan. Then they would lose horribly to Florida State by five touchdowns. That horrible loss would only fuel a five game winning streak before they hit one of their biggest blunders as they would have a 31 to nothing lead versus Maryland wither away as they lost in one of college football's biggest comebacks ever. The next week, they then got into a shootout with Doug Flutie and fell to them as Hale Flutie would come back to win and send Miami to an 8-4 record. But they would still go to a bowl game that season, and in the bowl game, they would get in another shootout and ended the season 8-5. This team should have been at least 10-3 or 11-2, as three of their losses were by two points, and they were leading in all of them late. So that is why the 1984 Miami team is the number three biggest busted team. And now number two on the list is a team that you might not know anything about or maybe never heard about. It's the 1956 Maryland Terrapins football team. I was going to put this team at number one, but they just had so much bad luck that I just couldn't do it. First off, this team was coming off of a legendary 1955 season where they were coached by a legend in Jim Tatum. They went 10 and one, but he would shockingly leave the university for his alma mater UNC quickly after the bowl game. Preseason hopes were high for the team, even though they lost 10 seniors, but they were bringing back the best underclass team ever, as their freshman team from the year before went undefeated in freshman games. Their new coach Tommy Mond only had a few moments of good this season, as the bad luck would hit them rather quickly. First they lost their starting quarterback because he was drafted to the Army, then another returning running back didn't enroll in the school, and after that the strangest thing would happen as their starting running back and backup center got sick with a serious illness, and the rest of the team had to be inoculated for jaundice. Yeah, and by the way, this would all happen before October, and it showed because Maryland was 1-1, one one, but then completely collapsed after that, as they would lose five in a row, and were shut out twice during that time, and this team hadn't been shut out in 70 games. Maryland would finish the season 2-7-1, and their offense could only score double digits twice. The terrible season was noticeable enough for the Associated Press to call this season one of the year's most disappointing teams. But that team couldn't beat out number one on the list of biggest busted teams from 1982, it's the Pitt Panthers. And the reason why I have the 1982 Pitt Panthers team as my number one biggest busted team is because they were coming off of three straight, 11 win seasons, they had Dan freaking Marino in his senior season, plus they had an amazing line with Hall of Famers Bill Freilich and Jimbo Colvert on it. But even though they seemed awesome on offense, it never balled out this year. Their offense only managed to score 25 points per game, which was 7 points less than the previous season, and Marino would throw for more interceptions than touchdowns this year too. But even though the offense wasn't clicking as well as previous years, they still had a great defense this year, which gave up 10 points per game and were second in the NCAA that year in that category. But with all that said, this team would still win their first 7 games. They would have some close calls along the way, like in their opener versus top 5 ranked UNC, where all the offense could get was a touchdown, but the defense would hold their own as they would win 7-6. Then in the backyard brawl a few weeks later, West Virginia would have a 13-0 lead throughout most of it, but Marina would get them in the end zone twice in the fourth quarter to allow them to win 16-13. They were now ranked number one, and at 7-0, they would play Notre Dame at home. Notre Dame were coming into the game 6-1-1, but were coached by Jerry Faust, who is routinely called one of the worst Notre Dame coaches ever. But on this day, he wasn't, and he coached up the Notre Dame defense to hold Pitt to only two touchdowns for the shocking 31-16 win and knocking Pitt from number one. Pitt would bounce back to win their final two games to be ranked number five when they would play in-state rival Penn State. 
Penn State were ranked number two in this game, and this game would help to propel the winner to a possible national title. Pitt would only manage one touchdown in the game, and Penn State would take over in the second half to win 19-10. This was the second year in a row where Pitt had a chance for a national title, only to lose in their final game to Penn State. With the loss, they still managed to stay in the top 10 and would play in the Cotton Bowl vs. SMU. And that game would result in another poor offensive outing as they would only get a field goal and would lose 7-3, ending the year 9-3. Pitt was close to a national title from 1980 to 1982, but I picked this year because this was a senior-related team with a Hall of Fame line, a Hall of Fame quarterback, and they couldn't get the offense rolling. You would think that a team like this would be putting up 30 points every week and would easily win the national title, but they didn't, and that is why they are my number one biggest busted team in college football from the year 2000 and before. And thank you so much for hanging out with me and joining me for another one of my great lists I bring you here. Uh, if you want to check out all the lists, I have a huge playlist to the side. I have almost 20 lists now all about college football, best teams, worst teams, upsets, ties. Check them all out to the side. Also, make sure you subscribe to the channel below and ring the bell, please. And of course, like this video and share this video with other college football fans and help out the channel below by going to my Patreon and just donating some money there. But just please subscribe to the channel. I'm trying to reach 1,000 subscribers before the end of the year. Thank you so much for joining me again.